Well, welcome to this tutorial, which is going to look at crowd simulation, which is a new feature in Houdini 14. And it can be quite complicated, but I hope we can simplify it a bit in this in this tutorial. The first thing that you need to do uh, when setting up a crowd simulation is to set up some animation clips. Uh, these are the different movements that your your agents, the, these are the, the, the characters that are running around in your crowd simulation, they're called agents the different movements that your agents will make. And the easiest uh, way to do this, if you're going to use your own uh, rig, your own character, is to create a digital asset. And I've, I've already, in fact, uh, created a digital asset, uh, which we will lay down. And you can see I've got this sort of very simple robot figure. And although this is not a tutorial on rigging, I'll just show you very briefly what's inside here. Uh, so. Uh, we'll dive inside, and we've got a network of bones here, uh, which enable us to control all of the bits of the body that we might want to move. This here, the robot body, is the actual geometry of the figure, and then in the skin node, we've got all the different capture nodes. Now, if you're going to create a digital asset, uh, your capture nodes need to be relative to the node here. So this this is telling the node to look in the environment above that node and to find the, the necessary bone here. And that means that because it's all relative, you can encapsulate this as a digital asset and you can make many copies of it and each of them will work independently because none of these references are absolute. Now you may wonder why we've used this very complicated bone system to animate what is a very simple piece of geometry where you could just use transforms probably to, to animate the individual parts of the figure. Well, that's because the crowd system requires you to have a rig uh, using bones and to have set up capture regions in order to be able to do the animation that it does. Those things need to be defined. Now, in this case, you also need to make sure that every bit of your geometry is uh, covered by a capture region. Now, I've left the colouring on here so you can see that these all are indeed captured by different bones. The uh, the issue is that uh, if you leave one out, uh, if, if this, for example, this body isn't actually going to be moved by the bone, but uh, if you'd left it out of the capture region, uh, then there's a danger it doesn't get rendered uh, by the crowd system. The crowd system will simply ignore it. So you do need to make sure everything is captured. So now we're moving on to a scene where I've I've got some defined animation. So let me just show you this. So we've got our, our robot figure, and unfortunately I left one of the bones in there, but it doesn't matter. So we've got three copies of the digital asset that I showed you earlier, and I've animated uh, the, the digital asset here to produce different movements corresponding to walking, standing, and something we're calling panicking. So first of all, let's uh, have a look at uh, walking. So we can see this, this just has the wheels go round, the head moves, the arm moves. And then if we have a look at the uh, standing, the, there's a little bit of arm movement, a little bit of head movement, much slower, and the wheels don't go round. And finally, uh, we've got panicking. Uh, the arms are, are up, the, the head moves round, and this flap at the front uh, flips open and closed. So those are the three uh, movements that we're going to use in our crowd simulation. And I've set those up using motion effects here and in the scene file you can have a look if you want to know how it's, how it's done. Um, the clips uh, in this case last uh, I've animated for the full thousand frames. You don't actually need to do that providing your clip loops. Uh, that is to say that uh, your animation starts in one position, the, the model moves and then after a certain number of frames it comes back to the original position uh, that's a loop and, and each of these animations needs to be looped and that could be over 50 frames 100 frames 1000 frames it, it doesn't matter so the first thing to do when setting up a crowd simulation is to bake out uh, these animations it's not strictly necessary to do this uh, as the first step but it does make life easier later on so the way to do this is to select uh, each of these in turn and then select bake agent and you enter a clip name. So in this case, uh, this is the walk clip. So I'll just say walk and then press OK. And you can see this has created uh, a now a, 
agent bake network and inside we've got this ROP which is going to bake out our, our walk clip and I'm going to repeat the same for the others in a moment. In fact, let me do that once we've uh, once we've baked this out. So uh, let's just have a look at um, at the parameters of this. So we've got an object which we're going to use to to capture the the the, the animation. We've got an agent name, and that'll default to the name of the digital asset. But I don't like that agent name very much, so I'm going to call it robot. And then. It's got different layers, and we're not actually going to cover layers in this tutorial. The key thing is the clip name. This is the state. This is the name of the state which corresponds to this animation. So when your agents are in the state, and we'll explain this later, the state of walking, this clip is going to be used to display uh, the, the animation. And then we don't need to worry about these so much. It's going to save out that rig that's in the digital asset. It's going to save out the, the layers that, that, that we're not going to go into. It's going to save out the shape library, in other words, the geometry of the robot. And it's going to save out these animation clips. And that's what it's going to do. Now, of course, uh, when we're saving out multiple copies of the same digital asset, these things, uh, the shape library, the layers, and the rig are going to be the same for each copy. So you're actually, you can turn off uh, these uh, tick boxes for all but the first uh, of, the, of the renders. It doesn't matter if it overwrites, because it's going to overwrite with the same data. So let me just come back out of this. And I'm going to pause the video for a moment, and then we're going to come back uh, having set up the render options for the other two uh, forms of motion. So I've now set up uh, those baking out nodes for all three of the uh, clips. And this is going to render them all out. I've attached them all to a merge node. So I can just render those out to disk. And that's very quick. And then if I have a look at my hip directory, this by default is going, let's have a look at the, uh, this by default is going to go into your hip directory agents and then the agent name and in this case my agent name is robot so if i have a look here we can see this is my hip directory and then we have um, agents uh, there are some tests that i've done earlier on but this is the one we just rendered out so we're getting these b clip files that's the animation we're getting at the layers i'm not going to talk about that we've got our rig and we've got the geometry of the robot So let's have a look at one of those clip files, just so you can see what it is. And I've got one should be loaded into here. So I think this is picking up uh, the standing clip. So if we have a look at the uh, motion FX view, and this is a chop net we've got here. So this is reading in that B clip file. You can see that we've got some omine. It's probably quite hard to see, but we've got some animation on the, the head. Uh, and some animation on the left and right arms, and the rest of it is just static. So that's that's the that's the animation. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a simulation with this. So what I'm going to do is I've got to, I've got two different states uh, that I'm going to use first of all, walking and standing, and I want to create some agents that are in one state and some agents that are in another state. Uh, when I do that. So uh, what I want to do is, first of all, I'll lose the tool, in fact. So I've defined a grid here, which is going to be the space on which my agents are going to be laid out. So with the grid selected, I'm going to click the Populate uh, control here from the Crowds tab. And then I need to click, s select the agent. So I'm going to select this uh, Walk agent and then press Enter. And we can see we get uh, these agents, robots, distributed across that grid in a random fashion. Now, in fact, I want the uh, two different agents to be in different states initially. And the best way to achieve that is, in fact, to create some points on our uh, space here, on our, our grid and then allow two different crowdsource nodes to use those. So let me use a scatter SOP. And I think uh, I'm going to use maybe 10 agents altogether, right? 
And what I'm actually going to do is now use a split node, which again is new in Houdini 14. Uh, you'll remember perhaps the workflow where you use two different blast nodes to delete different parts of of geometry. Well, this has the same effect uh, with one with the un the opposite bits of the group you select coming out here. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. So we've got ten points. So naught to four, going to go here. So that's uh, five will come into this crowdsource node. Let me control C, control V that to get another crowdsource node, and then I'll feed that into there and we'll get the others and then we can merge them together. So we've now got the crowdsource notes using the points. If it's provided with some points, it will use those as the as the origin for its for its robots, for its for its agents. And we're splitting the points, so the five points are going to come out here, the five points here, and when we combine them together, we get this. And the advantage of this is that because we've used a scatter node here, uh, with relaxation on, we know that they're going to be spread apart. They're not going to start uh, by bumping into each other. So let's have a look at the, uh, the, the the crowdsource node and talk a little bit more about its parameters. So uh, right at the top here, uh, what we've got is something which tells it where to find the animation clip. And at the moment, it's not reading it from disk, it's reading it directly from the digital asset. And that's actually going to cause a problem later on, but we'll we'll come to that in a second. Then the setup tab here, the first part of this, all of this is just telling it how to di distribute the points which become the agents randomly. And because we're feeding some points into this node, all of this is, is being ignored. And further down here, we've got the robot name. And I've changed this to robot, which corresponds to the name we used when we saved the clips. And the default state I've put on this on this part of the crowdsource node is going to be stand. The scale is obvious; that's just a scalar for the for the objects. The minimum and maximum speed is self-explanatory. The turn rate is is self-explanatory. The maximum force tells you how fast it can be accelerated by the forces that are going to uh, exist in the simulation. And then we've got initial velocity and heading. And we'll we'll come to those in a moment. The up vector, which is in the y direction you're very rarely going to need to, to change that. And then on the second tab here, and we'll come to use this in a minute, you can randomize these uh, these attributes so that we can get different agents moving at different speeds, for example, or with different headings or, or initial velocities. And we'll have a look at that as well in a second. And the second crowdsource node is the same, uh, except that uh, except that uh, what I've done is change the color associated with it to an orange. I've changed the agent name to robot and the default state instead of being stand is walk. So that's going to give us everything we need to actually set up the simulation. Uh, so let me go up to the object level. With my crowdsource node selected, we can select simulate and that'll take a moment to calculate. And then we can see that uh, it's set up a crowd simulation node here. And if I dive inside, we have the simulation set out for us. Let's just uh, press play for a moment and see what happens. And we can see that uh, the, the agents zoom off in a walking uh, state initially. Uh, in fact, let me just delete these nodes here. And then we can see it a bit better. So the ones that are orange, which were in the walk state, move off. And the ones here, uh, which are in the stand state, uh, stand still. But we might notice something, which is that even these standing ones, the wheel is rotating. So the animation clip it's using here is not the standing animation clip, but the walking animation clip. So why is that happening? Well, the answer lies back on the crowdsource node. If we have a look here, uh, we can see that uh, for the for both of these nodes, we're reading from the same rig, the walk rig, and in this case, we're reading from the walk rig, and that's why we're getting the same animation for both. Uh, what we need to do instead, let me select both nodes and change this to read the animation from disk. It's going to read it from that cached out clips uh, that we rendered out earlier, and that's much more efficient, uh, and that is 
why uh, it's important to render it out to disk. So this should now uh, work. So let's go back, have a look. So remember the orange ones are going to start walking, the other ones are going to be standing still. And we can see the orange ones are walking, the standing still ones, the wheels are not moving. This guy is actually walking, he's just got stuck because one of the behaviours of the crowd system is to avoid other agents and he's finding it hard to work out where to go in order to avoid other agents. Uh, one of the other things uh, we can do is to randomise the initial direction in which these uh, robots are facing. And we can do that, in fact, let's select both of these nodes. And we can do that by randomising the heading. So let's go down here and randomise heading. And what we want here, for example, is a heading of 101, and then a randomness of 101. And that'll give us a bit of randomness in the heading. Uh, at the moment, we can see really nothing has happened. And the reason for that is because if we have any initial velocity, or indeed any velocity defined, then the heading is taken from the velocity, not from the heading vector. So let me get rid of the initial velocity, and we can now see that our robots are all sort of more or less heading in different uh, directions. In fact, let me make that even more extreme by making this minus one, minus one. Right, and now they're heading in all, all different directions. And we can play that through, and our robots move off like so. So how do we uh, make this a little bit more interesting? Uh, let's, for example, have these robots that are in the standing state uh, move into a different state after a certain time. And we go down into our crowd simulation node. Uh, and perhaps now is the moment to explain what's going on here in this in this solver. So the first thing to say is that this is all just a particle network. Uh, this bottom part of the graph here is a very standard pop solver, particle solver. This thing that's called a crowd object is in fact a pop object. Uh, the crowd source is in fact just a pop source that's producing particles. It's only producing them on the first frame. Uh, and then this is new. This is the thing that's controlling the behavior of the agents. Uh, and we rarely need to change the parameters on here. We may not actually end up talking about this much. Uh, this does things like ensuring that the agents don't bump into each other. And then the nodes that matter are the ones over here, which are attached to the merge transitions uh, node and the ones up here, which are attached to the merge states node. And all a crowd simulation is it are agents that are in one of a number of fixed states, each of which has an animation clip and some behavior associated with it, or they can be in a transition from one state to another. So at the moment, we've got two states, which are the ones we defined. Uh, now, this is this is kind of default when you when you click the simulate button, these are, these names and these nodes are set up for you as a kind of default. And as it happens, that suits us fine. The, the stand and the walk animation we've got correspond to the behaviors here. So that at the top here, we've got a crowd state node. Uh, and this just has a name for the state and a name for the clip that covers the animation. And in this case, uh, walk is the name of the clip and the state key thing is to make sure that the clip name corresponds to what we what we saved out on disk. Now down here we can do some things which will affect how the animation is 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 placed onto the agents. Uh, you can first of all put a random time offset which means that if for example you've got the move, the arms of your agents moving there not not everybody moves at exactly the same uh, pace as if they were all marching together this will offset them so that some of them will be uh, in a different place from other, it looks much more random and much more realistic. So in general, you'd want some kind of time offset. Uh, the length of the time offset depends how long your clip is. Uh, this is in seconds, by the way. Uh, but it's good to have something. The in-place gate speed um, is uh, to link up the animation uh, with the movement. Now, for example, in our example, we have the, the wheels of the, of the robot are turning, and our robot is moving. 
Now, the, this allows you to, to coordinate how much the animation clip should be speeded up or slowed down so that the wheels look roughly as if they're moving at the right speed for the speed that the robot is, is, is moving. Uh, so, at the moment, this is 1.25. Let me uh, just have a little look and see when we when we see our robots moving. This is one that's going to move here. How does that look? Uh, and actually, you know, that, that looks all right. The, the, the wheel movement looks more or less uh, okay. We could, for example, take this down to 0.3 or something, and then we would see... Uh, the wheel appear to move much more quickly uh, compared to the the movement of the of the figure so this allows you to adjust the animation so it looks more realistic uh, with respect to the the movement of the agent so underneath uh, going back to our network underneath uh, these state nodes there could be one or more of these nodes which determine behavior and you can have several of these all uh, strung together and we'll demonstrate that in a moment and then this, these nodes here, that just applies to things that are in the walk state. And obviously this node here just applies to things in the stand state. Now this node is created by the, the default shelf tool. And this just tells the agents to wander around in a, in a random way. And the default settings are, are, are pretty good to get some, some sense of random movement. Uh, for the stand setting, this is a little bit of code that just sets the velocity and force to zero, which means that your agents are just going to stay where they are. At the moment, we don't have any transitions, so the, the agents that start off walking will just stay there. The agents that start off standing will just stay there. So let's demonstrate a, a, a transition. So the agents that are going to uh, stand after, say, two seconds of standing, they're going to start walking. And we can achieve that um, by using a crowd trigger node. So, uh, and we can set this to be current state duration. And we need a unique name here, so I'll call this state duration. And I want it to be greater than two seconds. So when the state, when we've been in the same state for, for two seconds or more, this is going to trigger. And when it triggers, the next node in the chain uh, will be evaluated. And what we want here is a crowd transition. So let's have a crowd transition that's going to transition from the state stand to the state walk. And the duration tells you how long it's going to take blending between those two states, blending between those two animation clips. And in this case, we can probably have that quite short. So let's say 0.2 of a second. And again, as with the, the randomization here of the, of the time offset, it would be pretty odd if all of them started moving from standing to, to moving uh, at the same time, so that all of the standing ones at the exact same time started moving. That doesn't look very realistic. So one of the other things you can do is add a random time offset, and that's going to tell them how long to sort of wait. So let's uh, give it a random time offset of two. And that's going to mean that they're all going to start moving at slightly different times. So let's have a look. So now we should see uh, that these ones start moving straight away. And then at a certain point, this one's moving, that one starts moving, that one moves. And they eventually all start moving. And just for show, let's do the opposite. Uh, let's start moving uh, the ones that were uh, walking into a stand position. Now you may think you could just uh, chain another transition node here and say that using this you just evaluate this and if and if this is true then it affects two transitions, one from walking to standing and one from standing to walking. In fact that doesn't work. You need to have two separate chains here. So let me copy and paste this and this needs to go from walk to stand. Okay, and we can chain this in. We can use the same trigger, uh, but we need two separate chains of logic going into the transition. So what we should see now is that uh, these start moving, and then 
after a while they stop and the other ones start moving and then after a while the other ones are going to start moving again and so on that's going to carry on ad infinitum okay uh, in fact that's not terribly interesting so i'm going to delete this node we won't we won't have the ones that are walking uh, going disconnect that we won't have the ones that are walking uh, stopping everything everyone will just carry on the other thing you can do is to have a number of different uh, nodes influencing the behavior of your of your agents so let's have a look at that okay so what i've done here is i've i've laid down a null and i've made it to uh, appear as a box and what we're going to do is we're going to have the the robot sort of seek out this this position so i'm going to just copy the translation parameter and then into the crowd sim i'm going to lay down a pop a second pop steer seek node pop steer seek and i'm going to have the goal uh, set to position and i'm going to paste the reference to the position of the null and that means that if we move the null this will automatically change and I've laid down this node uh, using the tab menu and you can see that at the moment it's set to pop force and that's because all of these pop steer nodes can either be used in a standard pop network or they can be used in a crowd simulation and we of course wanted to know crowd simulation so we need to change this to crowd steer force and we've got to wait We've got a force here which tells you how fast it's going to try and converge on this. Let's have a look at this now. Let's just play it through. Uh, so our ones that are walking are making their way towards that uh, null. <coughs> uh, and of course they've got two different behaviors influencing them. They've got a sort of random walk and they've got the attraction. So uh, in fact, let me let me move the box just to show you that it's. Uh, let's move it uh, over here. It's going to have a different attraction location. And let's change the weights. What determines the influence of these two different behaviors is this weight parameter. So let me give the uh, the random walk a weight of one and the seeking out the box uh, a weight of 0.1 uh, and what we should now see is that those they all sort of wander off vaguely in the direction there they're not really they're just basically wandering randomly okay uh, and let's just reverse that so let's give the seeking behavior a weight of one and uh, the wandering behavior a weight of 0.1 and then what we'll see is uh, that they all head off uh, pretty much straight away in the direction of the box. So I've now uh, set up this uh, node here, which we're going to use to demonstrate one other way of transitioning between different states. Uh, so in this case, uh, I've set up a box now at the moment there's a little bit of a bug in the crowd simulation so that you need to make sure you don't have the translation and scaling of the box done here at the object level you must do it here on the box node itself and I imagine that will be fixed before too long but in any case what we're going to do is when one of our agents goes into this box we're going to change it into another state uh, we're going to change it into the panic state so let's uh, go down into our crowd simulation and the first thing we need to do is set up a new state so let's do that so let's control c control v the stand state uh, press p to get up the uh, parameter editor and we're going to call this panic whoops panic which corresponds to the name of the clip we've already rounded out and i think uh, a pop steer wander node will also work for this so oops
So this is going to just wander about and perhaps on it, we will change some of these parameters and we're gonna we need to change it to a crowd force uh, and we need to give it maybe a force of five and five and an amplitude of ten yeah a force maybe of so let's change that to one and one okay so that's going to make our panicking robots uh, wander around in a random fashion and I can move this uh, connect this through here so that gives the new state and I need a new trigger so the trigger we need this time is object bounds which is the first one I need to make sure it's got a unique name so it's called object bounds and I'm going to use that SOP, that box that we've uh, set up earlier. So let's have a look at that box. There it is, the panic box. And what we're going to do is check. You can check when they come in, when they go, or all the time. And I'm going to check incoming. And then we need a crowd transition, which is going to transition from the walk state into the panic state. Okay, and we won't have a random time office at this time. We'll, we'll just, as soon as they enter that box, they're going to start going into the panic state. So let's uh, see whether this has worked. So they move around. There's one of them's going to move in there quite soon, I think. There, right, and he's now gone into the animation for the panic state. And so are these, these are all panicking, they're all panicking. But they're not moving, so what's going on? Uh, well, uh, this is one of the gotchas of this node, the, the crowd state node, which is because uh, this one was standing, the in-place speed has been set to zero. That means you, you mustn't use any movement in your animation, so it's, it's set to zero. This one, uh, of course, if it's set to zero, uh, it's going to assume you're not moving, so you need to set this to something other than whoops, set this to something other than zero. The default, let's put it to 1.25, uh, and that should fix that problem. And there it is. You can see it's it's moving around now perfectly well. Uh, you can see which state uh, one of these objects is in. Uh, by using the geometry spreadsheet. If we have a look at the crowd object and have a look at the geometry, whoops, uh, that's all of our particles, which are our agents, and that's all the data. Now, there's a hell of a lot of different uh, attributes here, so I'm going to hide all of them. One of them we might be most interested in is the state. Where is it? Down here. Uh, that tells you what state the the objects are in and we can also have a look at the clip name which tells you which clip is being used and at the moment there we are we can see they're all in the right clip state now you can see that the clip state has two uh, clip names possible an array of two that's because if you're in a transition from one clip to the next then this will have two uh, clips referred to so let's just play this through and have a look at it. So we can see that we can see these clips moving through. There we've got panic. And that's panicking there, for example. Now, if you want to uh, just do something that, that helps you identify more easily the, the state, uh, then one of the things you can do is just color the particle. So let's color these. Um, let's just color the particle. Uh, red if we go into a panic state and that should mean here we are that let's just play this out uh, when they go into panic state this one's going to go into a panic state in a moment there we are at the bottom goes red and we can see it's in a panic state so a final word uh, about what this network is actually producing so let's go to the output of the network uh, which is, sorry, in the 
crowdsource node. So uh, what's happened is when we use the, the shelf tool here, the simulate shelf tool, it's added an extra node to the crowdsource network, which is this import node, uh, which now has the display flag on it. So that's the thing that's bringing in uh, the agents. So what exactly is it bringing in? Well, if we right click on it, we get an enormous uh, amount of, uh, of information. So I think so what I'm going to do is use an attribute uh, delete to get rid of most of that. So I'm going to delete everything apart from the clip, things beginning with clip, and that should give us a little bit less. So we can now see that we've got 10 points, 10 primitives, 10 vertices, and 10 packed agents. Now a packed agent is a form of packed geometry uh, which uses uh, attributes uh, on the on the agents on the points of the packed geometry uh, to uh, link those geometric uh, forms to an animation and by storing attributes which refer back to the rig uh, which we saw right at the beginning refer to the clip uh, and refer to the, the, the orientation of the point and the velocity of the point it's able, uh, the, the, the packed primitive is able to be rendered in the viewport and indeed if we use the rendering engine in a very efficient way in the same way that uh, we can reproduce thousands of copies of an object using a packed object uh, very efficiently uh, the packed agent allows us to produce a large number of, of figures and render them in different states of animation very efficiently. So what appear to be points uh, in our simulation, because they have this data attached to them, uh, the, the, the various things that we're seeing here, because they have that data attached to them, uh, they are enabled, that enables them to be, to be shown in the viewport and rendered as the animated figures uh, that are our agents in the simulation. So that's a very basic introduction to the crowd uh, tools in Houdini uh, 14. Uh, I hope it's been useful.